Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, I'd love to stop talking about measles more than anything in the world, but I can't because South Carolina is now doing some crazy stuff, which I'll tell you about. But first of all, worldwide, deaths fell by 88% over the last five years from measles, according to the World Health Organization. But the virus is spreading all over the world, and it, it, it's so bad. In the past year, 59 countries have reported very large disruptive outbreaks. So for whatever reason, people aren't dying from it, but it's just all over the place, uh, and it's a real problem. So what's going on in South Carolina, which is the latest outbreak, reminds me of why we have public health. So uh, it, it takes only a, a, the state of South Carolina to show this. So you think about what is public health. It's the science and art of preventing disease, promoting health, and protecting and improving the health of entire communities, not individuals. And you do that through uh, efforts like disease surveillance that we do in health education and policy. That is what public health is. So what is, the, what is the version of public health in South Carolina, you might ask? Well, their version is you should vaccinate your kids, but it's your choice. So <laughs> that is not public health. That's, anyway, that's individual health. That's personal health. And as a result, South Carolina now has 120 confirmed cases with more than 250 people exposed and in quarantine. And most of these are in Spartanburg. So if you think about it, if you're a parent that has decided not to vaccinate your child, okay, it's your decision. But you know, did you think about the hundreds of other parents who decided also not to vaccinate their kids? One kid gets infected and you all are quarantined. So you know, you think about it, it's, it's your neighbors actually affect yourself, you, your own family, not just them. And then if you happen to be the one who chose to be vaccinated, to have your kids vaccinated, you know, I'd wonder if it's 92% effective, but if there's a giant outbreak in a school, would I send my kid to school? I don't know. And a lot of the schools are cur curtailing activities. So it's sort of like back to COVID again. You're removing kids from schools because people haven't followed recommendations. But I blame the public health department in South Carolina. They should have said it's mandatory. A responsible, a responsible public health department would say it's mandatory with exceptions, and there are religious exceptions. But if you say it's up to you, then no one's going to do it. So never get rid of measles this way. If you see weekly cases, once again, big, big numbers. We're setting, we've set a record now in 1,912 cases. 11% of those cases get hospitalized. It's a huge burden on the health system. There have been three confirmed deaths from measles. All of this is unnecessary. All of it is uh, pre preventable. And I remind everyone, I like to show this graph every now and then, uh, uh, measles was eliminated from the United States in, in 2000. It was declared eliminated. That didn't mean that we didn't get it, just 95% of the population was uh, protected through vaccines. But occasionally, there'd be a case that came in from another country and there'd be a small, uh, you know, one or two cases. But it was eliminated from transmission in the United States until the last three or four years. And if you look, we, each year we're setting new records. And all of this, all of this is preventable if people would just get their kids vaccinated. So these are the hot spots. Of course, the biggest that outbreak was in Texas, but now South Carolina joins into the fun. So it's, we're in the middle of respiratory virus season. Uh, it's in full force. This is the TEFI data. There's an increase in adenovirus, which is a pretty severe uh, upper respiratory uh, infection. Parainfluenza is increasing. RSV, you should get your RSV shot if you're over the age of 60, if you haven't had one. Uh, influenza A is beginning to pick up. I'll show you in more detail. The, the, the scale is compressed, so you don't see it very much. Norovirus, which is a GI virus, is actually quite high. Uh, SARS is low, but it's not eliminated. And I, I know a couple of people who just had a uh, case of SARS, of COVID. This is the uh, wastewater data from uh, influenza, for influenza, and you can see uh, it's beginning to really peak. This is about the same time it peaked last year, it usually starts in late November, December, and it's exactly the same. And if you look at the CDC data, it's trending up. 7% increase in clinical lab positivity, 3% increase in uh, outpatient respiratory virus uh, illnesses uh, in presenting in the emergency room. The dominant strain right now is H3N2. Uh, if you recall, last year, uh, H1N1 was the predominant strain until late in the season when H3N2 picked up, but now it's H3N2. 97% of the influenza viruses are A, 3% are B, and of the A viruses, 85% are H3N2, and 15% or so are H1N1. 
So one little minor detail. The H3N2 is a little bit different from last year's H3N2. It's called a little bit of uh, genetic drift. Uh, it's now being termed a, a subclade, which is the variety of the virus. It's called subclade uh, K. Uh, now, uh, if you look at H3N2, 86% or 87% are really of this new variety. It's a very small change in the hemagglutin gene from last year, and unfortunately, the current vaccine is the last year's H3N2, so there's a minor mismatch. But if you look at effectiveness, early studies from the United Kingdom show that it's, it's pretty effective. 75% effective at keeping kids out of the hospital, 40% effective at keeping adults out of the hospital. So it's, you know, it's not great, but it's it saving a lot of lives. And think about your kids. The CDC has estimated there have been almost 2 million illnesses so far from uh, flu this season, 19,000 hospitalizations, and 730 deaths from flu already. The CDC is recommending that anyone six months or older who has not yet been vaccinated should be vaccinated. Um, remember, get the high-dose vaccination. Uh, and, and, and for those of you at risk, like pe people in my age group, our age group, 60, you know, 60 and over, I should be so lucky it was 60, uh, there's still Tamiflu. There are other you know, antivirals that if you do get sick, uh, it, the vaccine is very effective at preventing hospitalization, but you can also limit the illness by taking an antiviral. Okay. Bird flu is still in the news. Big outbreak in Indiana. 15,000 birds were uh, shown to be infected with H5N1 from commercial duck meat facilities in Elkhart, LaGrange, and Noble counties. 19,400 birds have been affected in LaGrange. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Three counties that border on the northeastern part of the state. This is the typical time of year because migratory birds, waterfowl mostly, are, are migrating back and forth in the fall and the spring. And of course, Indiana is right in the Mississippi flyway. So as the birds migrate uh, south and they're infected with H5N1, they come, they land, and, and they interact with some of the poultry farms, and that's what happens. Now, as, as you know, I'm, I'm always pointing out that uh, it's concerning when any mammal species becomes infected because it, it's always the concern that eventually, if living in mammals, the virus will change and become infectious for, for humans and could be an, a global pandemic that we're not all that well prepared for. So we already know a bunch of mammals get infected, livestock or pigs, cattle and goats, rodents do, marine mammals, we talked about the sea lion outbreak, the seals outbreak, bears get infest, infected, domestic cats, of course. We talked about the domestic cats dying from eating raw milk. <laughs> of course, Robert Kennedy says we should all eat raw milk, but that's another issue. Uh, raccoon dogs, you know, the, the putative reservoir for uh, the beginning of SARS, but raccoon dogs also get H5N1, foxes and coyotes, and now bats. Now, it's always concerning when bats uh, start harboring any virus because it seems to be really good at spreading them to people. So uh, bats in Peru have now been uh, identified as having H5N1. So there's increasing uh, new data that's coming out about the safety and problems with mRNA vaccines. As you know, uh, uh, the CDC and NIH canceled all, like $500 million in <laughs> mRNA con at research contracts because of the concerns, long-term concerns. So uh, there was an, uh, an interesting study that came out of France, uh, looked at four years, all-cause mortality in people 18 to 59. It was 22.7 million vaccinated individuals compared to 5.9 million unvaccinated uh, individuals. And what it showed was vaccinated individuals had a 74% lower risk of death from severe COVID, and importantly, no increase of all, any cause mortality over the median follow-up. In other words, all the concerns about mRNA uh, vaccination might do something bad. Well, there are 22.7 million people filed for four years and have absolutely no increase in any mortality. So one more reason why we should be studying mRNA vaccines. And uh, another interesting study came out about uh, COVID vaccination for children, it, reducing the emergency room visits. So it was found as vaccines were found to decrease the risk of needing medical care in the first six months after vaccination by 76% in children under four and 56% in children 15, uh, five to 17. So again, very uh, effective at preventing children from being uh, infected and having to go uh, to the emergency room. And finally, the fun never ceases. Uh, in other vaccine news, you know, you, you heard probably that um, 
the panel at the CDC decided uh, they would eliminate the requirement for vaccination of newborns with hepatitis B. Uh, so the Pediatrician Society, the APA, got together and they totally rejected that recommendation. And what they pointed out is that it still remains a major problem. Uh, the panel had mentioned that the United States was an outlier because uh, uh, most people don't, most other countries don't have universal vaccination requirements, but that's not true. Most do. And also, most countries actually test all, all pregnant women for hepatitis, and they have universal coverage. So the ones that don't require it are already testing the pregnant mother and know if the, if the mother is uh, infected. In our country, almost 20% of uh, mothers are not tested. And so how would you know? And then the other thing is if you can get hepatitis after you've been tested anyway. So the concept of, of preventing infection in newborns was really effective. effective. And cases of hepatitis in, in children plummeted by 99% from 16,000 cases in early 1990s to fewer than 20 perinatal infections per year. And we eliminated that vaccination requirement. So there's no, there's no accounting for levels of stupidity that are unknown. Okay, so I want to end, I want to end this week with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, big shout out and thank you to Rabbi Peretz Lazaroff, his wife and all the volunteers from the Aishel House who organized a wonderful celebration at Baylor on Tuesday at sundown to light the candle for the third night of Hanukkah. His father, Rabbi Lazarov, began the tradition of placing a menorah at Baylor 35 years ago, and we're really grateful for their generosity, and it was a lot of fun. So for those of you observing Hanukkah, I hope you have a great holiday. And congratulations to Peng Fei Liao, Associate Professor of Molecular Human Genetics, who received the 2026 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Medicine from the Texas Academy of Medicine, Engineering, Science, and Technology. He was, uh, he was chosen for his transformative use of genome and RNA sequencing to improve the diagnosis of rare diseases. So congratulations to him. And a shout out to Dr. Stacy Rose, Associate Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease, who was selected as the Vice Chair for the Professional Development Committee of the Infectious Disease Society of America. And they're charged with developing and implementing strategies to support continuous learning and professional development in, in the ID profession. And finally, I just want to say that uh, it's been another week uh, in COVID-19. It seems like another year. Uh, it's hard to believe that just uh, three weeks ago, we closed the rodeo. And at the time, that seemed like a really, really controversial move to make. The numbers don't look so good. Uh, this week, we've had an increase in number of cases. New cases are now over 400. Let it treat. Come here. OK, can you sit? Good girl. Couldn't you get down? Nope, get down. Good girl, okay. Darn, that was pretty darn good. Janet was said it was not an outstanding Oscar uh, event. She didn't like any of the movies, so she didn't really care. <laughs> That's my sister. Uh, thought all the dresses were boring and ugly, except for Halle Berry's. And deaths, again, uh, is a lagging indicator, but beginning to trickle down to the point where it's only, <laughs> I say, uh, only uh, 1,800 people dying per week of this disease, so it's not going away. Hello, Paul. So, 179 episodes was not enough. No. You had to make 180 video messages. Newman. You had to beat Newman. Seinfeld. You're going to make 180 now, aren't you? I can feel it. It's germinating so now. So on your way back to your place, if you look in the concrete, and so actually this wild type here is called Columbia because it was a professor at Columbia went outside and picked one out of the concrete. It's New York City. New York City. Oh, so then it's, this, a, it's like rat resistant. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. It's beautiful. It goes very nicely with your beautiful red hair. Looking so intense with it. Like motionless. It's so intense. What's up? We have a milestone. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> big milestone. This is our 300th episode. And a big shout out to my Baylor team, but particularly a giant shout out to Billy Miller, our videographer, <laughs> who has. <laughs> dutifully fulfilled this obligation for the last, I don't know, four or five years. But I want to also, big shout out to Anna Rodriguez, Lori Williams, Claire Bassett, 
We're constantly finding interesting articles, and of course, to my sister Janet, who is my constant foil and reminder of all things on the minds of relatives. Anyway, have a wonderful holiday. <laughs> Have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.